Albert Einstein, the first and only human being to ever be voted Time Magazine's Man of the Century. And he's the single individual that other planets throughout the universe wish they had had born on their own planet. <laughs> I know this because I'm a cosmologist. Now, despite the appearance, that doesn't mean I study hair and nails. Although, <laughs> see me after the show. No, I study the origin of the universe. And the one thing I have in common with Albert Einstein is known as the imposter syndrome. And I'm sure many of you tonight can identify with this, in, this m emotion, this sensation that you're not who people think you are, that you're a fraud, a charlatan, or as Einstein called himself, an involuntary swindler. <laughs> he was not worthy in his own mind of the attention, affection, and accolades that he received. Now, if this is true of Albert Einstein, what hope is there for you and me? Well, <clears throat> 10 years ago, I was riding high. An experiment <clears throat> that I had built along with my team and put down at the bottom of the world called BICEP was the toast of the scientific community. We claimed we had discovered what or who had put the bang in the Big Bang. We were celebrated all around the world on CNN, on the BBC, and in the newspaper of record, the San Diego Union Tribune. <laughs> For this accomplishment of taking us back to a trillionth of a trillionth of a trillionth of a second after the universe came into existence. I was riding high. I was sort of half expecting a Nobel Prize would land right in my lap. The Nobel Prizes, the highest accolade in the arts, in science, in medicine, and in peace, were established by their patriarch, Alfred Nobel, who died childless, and he was one of the richest men in human history. He dedicated his entire wealth, built out of the creation of dynamite. He was accused of killing more people in the history of humanity than any other individual, and to rehabilitate his image, he dedicated his a massive fortune to the Nobel Prizes, which bear his name. And it's every scientist's secret dream, whether they admit it or not, to win one of these gilded images of Alfred Nobel. Because it comes along with a little check for about a million dollars. So it's not only rewarding financially, it's also rewarding scientifically. So we were riding high. I was, uh, was quite convinced, as were newspapers, colleagues, etc., and all that was needed was the most important thing in science, confirmation. It's not enough for an authority, even an Einstein, to say something is true. It needs to be independently verified. And for me, it was just a matter of time before we would get confirmed and I would be whisked off to Stockholm to meet King Gustav, bow down after a full meal of freshly cooked rare reindeer. That's what they eat, they tell me. Well, the days turned into weeks. The weeks turned into months. And then a year went by. And ultimately, I'm ashamed to admit that that Nobel Prize never showed up. Because we weren't confirmed or validated. We were actually refuted and humiliated by the most common substance in the known universe, dust, particles of dust that trail your toddler or come up in your dryer lint. Microscopic versions of this, a meteorite. This is a fragment of the early solar system. And this object in great miniature form is distributed throughout our galaxy. And instead of seeing the imprimatur of the Big Bang, we saw an imposter signal a mimicking signal that lured us into thinking we saw what we wanted to see. It's the oldest form of bias. And the most pernicious form of bias, it's called confirmation bias. When a scientist sets out to see something and he or she discovers it. Luckily, science is self-correcting. But the newspapers that had celebrated us were merciless. They had the worst, most awful headlines, bicep, blown into the dust, dust in the wind, 
The New York Times even said, stardust got in their eyes. Shame on you, New York Times. Good thing you're not the paper of record. And I laugh about it now, but 10 years ago it was humiliating. I didn't know if I'd ever be able to get the, to get the attention and affection of my colleagues, of my university, maybe even my children. And thank God for tenure. <laughs> Because, because without it, I would have had a, got a real job. <laughs> but luckily, I resolved in that moment to be a better scientist, to ask the dust and seek advice from those who had confronted dust themselves. And I came upon the wisdom of a great sage, not Albert Einstein, but his name is Rabbi Simcha Bunim, and he lived over 200 years ago. And he had the following piece of advice. When you're depressed, when you're feeling low and disconsolate, you should carry a note in your pocket. And that note, when you pull it out, should say, the whole universe was made for me. On the other hand, when you're feeling a little too haughty, a little too high and mighty, you might say, maybe a little too much chutzpah, you should reach into the other pocket and in doing so, pull out a note. And that note will say, you're nothing but dust and ashes. <laughs> now, Rabbi Simcha, 200 years ago in the shtetls of eastern Poland, he wasn't a scientist. He wasn't studying the early universe, of course. But I could learn from him. And so too could I learn from my colleagues and friends. And I set out to ask advice on what many of us have nowadays, I'm told, there's millions of these, a podcast. I'm the host of the Into the Impossible podcast, hosted right here at UC San Diego. And the Into the Impossible podcast explores ideas from geniuses, from artists. I even interviewed an astronaut, Jessica Meir, while she was floating around 200 miles above our heads in the International Space Station. And 18 of the interviewees that I've had the honor of hosting have won the Nobel Prize. Unlike me. I mean, spoiler alert, my first book is called Losing the Nobel Prize. <laughs> and one of them is shown here. It's Barry Barish on the left. Barry is my hero. He's humble, he's brilliant, and he was one of the three co-leaders of an experiment called LIGO, the Laser Interferometric Gravitational Wave Observatory. Say that 10 times fast. <laughs> And Barry and his team measured a cacophony of space-time when two black holes, each one 30 times the mass of our sun, collided together a billion light years away, a billion years ago. Nobody knows the galaxy in which this occurred. But Barry and his team built a fantastically sensitive instrument, and detected it, and it whisked the three of them eventually to Stockholm, where he did get to have that reindeer sandwich. So jealous. <laughs> And when he came on my podcast, I asked him, I said, Barry, what advice do you have to your former self? And he said, Brian, right now I tell myself to get over the imposter syndrome. I said, well, you mean when you were younger? No, 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 he said, right now. I have the imposter syndrome worse than ever. I said, you're kidding me. You're among the hundred living people on earth who have a Nobel Prize. What do you possibly have to feel inadequate, ashamed, an imposter about? And he told me, when you win a Nobel Prize, you get that golden medal, you meet that king, and you get that slice of the million dollar prize purse. But the Swedes are crafty. They want to make sure that you don't come back and say, hey, show me the money, I didn't get it. So you sign a logbook. And in that logbook are the names of every single person who's ever won the Nobel Prize. And Barry said, I'm a curious guy. So I turned the pages back, who won it? UC San Diego's Maria Gephardt Mayer, she won it. Enrico Fermi, featured in Oppenheimer this past year, he won it. Richard Feynman, a fellow professor of Barry's at Caltech, he won it. But Barry told me his heart stopped when he saw the name Albert Einstein, in Einstein's own handwriting, a hundred years ago. He said, I'm not worthy to be mentioned in the same breath as Albert Einstein let alone to have my name in the same book that he actually handled. 
I said, Barry, I've got good news and good news for you. Because it turns out Einstein called himself an imposter. He said, I am but an involuntary swindler. And I said, that's not all. He also felt inadequate before Isaac Newton and inadequate to be mentioned as a physicist. And I said, that's not all. Because Isaac Newton had the imposter syndrome. And Barry said, you're kidding me. This is nonsense. He said, no. I said, no. Newton himself wanted to live up to the ideals of just one man, Jesus Christ. And he felt short, of course, as everybody could. But he did attempt in his own way, interestingly enough. The only way Newton could emulate Jesus Christ was to do the thing that Jesus did, not turn wine into water into wine or loaves into fishes, but to die a virgin. <laughs> that, he claims, was his highest accomplishment, not gravity, not calculus, nothing like that. Leave that for another time. <laughs> so Barry told me that helped him. But I thought, well, what if you aren't one of the few people on earth that still have a Nobel Prize and are alive? What are you going to do if you're thinking about having kids? Maybe you're not ready. What if you want to ask your boss for a raise or apply to nursing school? You might feel completely unworthy. And so throughout these interviews with geniuses and luminaries throughout the world, I've noticed that Deep down inside, they all feel this notion of inadequacy. So I've come up with three different tools and three observations that I've made from interviewing these incredible people. The first one is to have a stack of proof that you are who you say you are, that you're capable of achieving great things. Number two is not to focus either on being super arrogant and confident, which you do need to be a good scientist, no scientist has ever done anything great without the confidence that he or she could take on nature and maybe win. But if you're too confident, you leave yourself vulnerable to humility, humiliation, even by microscopic grains of dust. But if you're too humble, you will lack that confident nature. You have to find the balance. And number three and finally, realize that your heroes all feel this inside. Whether they admit it or not, they feel this nagging sensation that they're not enough, which is ironic because they are enough. No one can outdo you at being you. And that is the most crucial lesson of all. So the next time you feel that sensation of nervousness coming up, that you're not ready, you're not worthy, realize it might be a sign that you're on the right track, but it is not enough. Because you also have to have the confidence that you might be the next Albert Einstein. Thank you very much.